Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this open information session for the Yanjing Academy of Peking University's Politics and International Relations Research Area. For your information, we are recording this evening's session and we will be posting it on our website so you can refer to it at a later date. My name is Brent Haas. I am Distinguished Associate Professor at the Yanjing Academy of Peking University, as well as the Director of Admission Affairs here at YCA. So let me tell you a little bit about how today's presentation will proceed. I'm gonna start off with a general introduction, fairly comprehensive, to the Yanjing Academy's program. Um, we will then be inviting two uh, Yanjing scholars, one who is currently in the second year of her master's program with us, and then one who graduated last year. Both of these scholars were in the broad research area of politics and international relations, and they'll talk to you about their experiences their coursework, um, their relationship with their advisors, et cetera. Since this is a webinar, you will not be able to turn on your microphone or your video, but please feel free to put any questions that you might have into the Q&A section, uh, the Q&A function on Zoom, and we will address those questions in the order in which they come. Um, in general, we will be addressing most of the questions live at the end of all three presentations, but my colleagues are online right now. And if there are any questions that can be addressed very quickly and easily in the Q&A function, they will go ahead and do so. So uh, once again, thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, good evening from Beijing and uh, wherever you may be. Um, hope you're all doing well. So let's go ahead and get started. Peking University is uh, China's uh, most influential institution of higher education. Um, now we do have a slight um, competition with our, our neighbors across the street here, but certainly in the realm of humanities and social sciences, PKU's uh, preeminence is unquestioned. Peking University was founded in 1898 as a part of the 100 Days of Reform Movement um, led by the second to last emperor of the Qing Dynasty. Um, in 1898, Peking University was founded as the Jingshi Da Xuetang, the Imperial University of Peking. On the right, you can see the scenic Western Gate of PKU's campus. Uh, if it calls to mind, perhaps um, Chinese palatial architecture, like maybe the Forbidden City, that makes sense because a large portion of uh, Peking University's campus was originally built as part of a summer palace complex for the Qing Dynasty's imperial ruling house and their family. Peking University is really a beautiful place um, to live, to study, and to work. It's also incredibly historically and culturally significant in China. Here you can see some of the other lovely scenes from PKU's campus. It is really scenic and, and quite stunning. Uh, I would like to point out the center photo here. This is the Jingyuan courtyard, the grassy area in the central western portion of Peking University's campus. Uh, those two-story, slightly sloped um, rooftop buildings you see are the buildings where Yanjing Academy has our administration and our classroom buildings. So this spot here is not only beautiful, but it's also really the center of academic and cultural life for the Yanjing Academy. Now the Yanjing Academy at Peking University is our name to call together a couple of the important legacies of uh, the development of higher education in China, China studies in China, as well as international cooperation uh, in academia. Because this spot here, Jingyuan, was the original campus of another university, Yanjing University, which was active from 1916 to 1952. Yanjing University was an American-run Christian university, a liberal arts school that at the time was bringing the best practices of liberal arts education to the nascent Chinese higher education system in the first decades of the 20th century. Peking University moved from their old campus down closer to the center of the city up to the current PKU campus in 1952. So our name, the Yanjing Academy of Peking University, is calling to mind both of those academic traditions. So Peking University today has over 8,200 faculty members organized into 49 schools and departments on campus. And those faculty members mentor 43,000 full-time students and just under 2,800 international students on any given year. 
the Engineering Academy is incredibly fortunate to have the full support of Peking University's uh, faculty, administration, and staff. So the Engineering Academy of Peking University is a fully funded two-year residential master's program in China studies. Having run the admission cycle um, for over a year now and having gotten to know current and former Yenjing scholars, uh, I can certainly attest to the fact that we are a magnet for outstanding young scholars, many of whom will go on to become leaders in whatever field they choose to pursue. And Peking and Yenjing Academy is also involved in um, a sort of great experiment of bringing the best practices of interdisciplinary education and training our scholars in interdisciplinary research methodologies within the broader defined fields of humanities and social sciences in the People's Republic of China. And now this last one here, Catalyst for International Dialogue. You know, although this might sound like the most talking pointy of all these talking points here, um, I think uh, Yenjing scholars would certainly attest to the fact that, you know, having shared interests with people from all over the world, studying uh, China, in China, um, and the discussions you have in class, on campus, in the dormitory, really do lead to some eye-opening and uh, mind-expanding experiences, what we might call international dialogue. So let's talk a little bit more about the details uh, of the Yanjing Academy. So we are a residential college, college program. So what that means is all first-year Yanjing scholars are required to live in our dormitory together. So this, we believe, uh, makes for mm, a deeper sense of community and getting to know your classmates in the, the year with you at Yanjing Academy in a fairly short period of time. Now, international students um, who make it into the Yanjing Academy are required to be on campus in Beijing for their first year. We encourage all students, including international students, to stay in Beijing for their second year as well, to um, develop deeper connections to the Yanjing Academy community, to get to know the next incoming cohort of Yanjing scholars, to more fully experience the academic culture at Peking University, and get to know Beijing as a city and China as a country a little bit better. But international scholars do not have to be based in Beijing for their second year. And I'll talk about some of the ways that that, that works, should that be uh, the correct choice for you. Scholars from mainland China, from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, however, are required to be resident in Beijing for both years of the Yanjing Academy master's program. Now, the language of instruction and administration at Yanjing Academy is in English. So no prior proficiency in the Chinese language is required for admission. That having been said, we are a China studies graduate program. So for those who already have Chinese language proficiency or have majored or minored in something related to China studies or East Asian studies, you should certainly emphasize that in your application materials. Now, Yanjing Academy has designed our curriculum to encourage and in some ways to push our scholars outside of Yanjing Academy into the broader academic community at Peking University. The um, all scholars in their first year are required to complete 31 academic credits and our core required courses at YCA only occupy 14 or 15 of those academic credits. Now leaving the remaining 50% give or take to potentially be taken outside of Yanjing Academy and other departments and schools at Peking University. For most of our scholars, that means taking content courses taught in English outside of Yanjing Academy. But for some scholars, uh, perhaps mainland Chinese scholars or those who are already fluent in Chinese, they can take courses taught in Chinese in other departments and schools at Yanjing Academy and at Peking University. Pardon me. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and I'll tell you a little bit more about something that I imagine you're curious about. Let's talk money. At least in North America and to a certain extent in the United Kingdom, perhaps less so in continental Europe, but finding a fully funded master's program is very difficult indeed. 
So the NG Academy offers our fellowship package to solve your um, financial and life needs while you're here studying with us. The Engine Fellowship covers your full tuition. Accommodation. In the first year, that is a required accommodation in the Engine Academy House dormitory. It also offers a monthly living expense stipend of 3,000 renminbi, uh, which will roughly be about 550 US dollars, give or take. In the first year, we also offer round trip travel stipend from your home city to Beijing in the fall of uh, your first academic year and back to your home city at the end of your first academic year. And finally, the Engine Fellowship also offers a basic medical insurance package. This medical insurance is specifically designed for international students living and studying in China. Now, this is a major investment we're making in the roughly 120 scholars we accept into the program every year. And so, um, at the end of the first year, we conduct an academic performance review. What this means is if you fulfill all of the academic standards and requirements in the first year, and these are clearly explained in our orientation and laid out in our academic handbook, these requirements include completing 31 academic credits, not failing any core courses, and maintaining a certain minimum GPA. You then reapply for the second year Yanjing Fellowship, and as long as you meet those academic standards, you will receive the second year fellowship. But in the second year, there are some other options available for some Yanjing scholars. As I mentioned before, international scholars do not have to reside in Beijing. We certainly encourage you to stay in Beijing for your second year, but sometimes your research topic, or perhaps an internship experience, or perhaps just life, uh, mandates that you are not based in Beijing for your second year. If that's the case, you can still receive a partial Yanjing Fellowship for your second year. That would include tuition and a monthly and the monthly living expense stipend. If you are not based in Beijing, you will not receive uh, the housing. You will not receive the medical insurance for scholars residing in China nor will you receive the um, round trip travel stipend. In fact, second year scholars do not receive the round trip travel stipend, first year scholars do. Now, another option available to both, um, to all second year Yanjing scholars is living off campus in Beijing. Should a scholar choose to do so, then they will receive a housing stipend from their second year Yanjing fellowship. And that'll be enough to cover uh, a room in a shared apartment in Beijing. Unfortunately, with rents rising so quickly in Beijing, it's generally not going to be enough for you to um, rent a full apartment to yourself. In the second year, there are also other funding opportunities granted on a competitive application basis. These include uh, teaching assistantships, uh, residential assistantships, and office assistantships to allow second year scholars to contribute to the Yanjing Academy community in a new way and get a little more funding support in their second year as well. Okay, um, now this is a pretty important slide here and I wanna spend a little bit of time on this slide and coming up later in the presentation to talk about the research areas at Yanjing Academy. You're looking at the six research areas um, in which all Yanjing scholars uh, conduct their research in their two years here. Now, we are an interdisciplinary master's program. Once you're in the program with consultation, with, under consultation with your uh, faculty or thesis advisor, you can design your own course of study. You can take classes in any field as long as you and your advisor think that it uh, is of interest to you and potentially useful for, to prepare you for your master's thesis research. But these six research areas are important to your experience at Yanjing Academy in three key ways. The first is your application. When you apply to the Yanjing Academy, you will choose one of these six research areas to focus on. Since today's presentation is focused mainly on politics and international relations, I assume most of you are interested in potentially applying to this research area. Now, politics and international relations, just like any of the other six research areas, uh, is a very, very broad topic. It can include political science, 
can also include international relations. It can include um, analysis of you know, bilateral relations with China and other places around the world or multilateral relations or China and international organizations. So even within this defined research area, there is a lot of flexibility for you to pick courses and design a research project. But you do need to pick one in your application. And we will be reviewing your application. Um, we'll look at your extracurriculars, we'll look at your CV, your internship experience, your work experience, obviously your academic performance. But we're also going to be um, assessing your academic training um, with an eye to um, guaranteeing that if you are accepted, you will be well prepared to conduct graduate level research in the research area to which you have applied. So we'll talk a little bit more about this coming up later in my presentation. So that's the first way that a research area is important to your experience. The second way in which selecting a research area is important to your experience at Yanjing Academy is in the evaluation of your master's thesis. So at Peking University, you first must have your um, thesis advisor approve the final draft of your thesis and say, yes, this thesis is ready for a defense. The second step is an oral defense of your thesis with multiple faculty members uh, discussing and asking questions about your methodology, your findings, you know, any part of your thesis. And then finally, Peking University adds one more step in the evaluation of your master's thesis. That step is finding two faculty members in fields directly related to or adjacent to your research area, politics and international relations, and they will read and review your thesis. You will not know who they are. They might not know you individually, but they will look specifically at your thesis paper to assess whether or not it meets the standards of the field and of Peking University's um, you know, graduate studies office. And if it makes a contribution, uh, a scholarly contribution to the field in which you research. So that is the second way in which choosing a research area is important to your experience at Yanjing Academy. And finally, when you graduate, one of these research areas will be on your master's degree diploma. It will say Peking University, Master of Law, China Studies, Politics and International Relations, or Peking University, Master of History, China Studies, History and Archaeology, et cetera. So in the application, in the thesis review, and in the graduation and diploma, these are the ways that the selecting your research area is important to your experience here. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time introducing the core courses that all Yanjing scholars are required to take in their first year. China in Transition 1 and 2 is a two semester multidisciplinary look at contemporary China. The first semester in the fall of your first year is structured along uh, large lectures or faculty symposia discussions or debates that all Yanjing scholars attend at the same time. This is then followed immediately by a smaller discussion section led by a teaching assistant and about 15 to 20 scholars together. So you'll have readings assigned, you'll hear the lecture or the, the faculty discussion, and then you go into a graduate student teaching assistant led discussion section right afterwards. The second semester of China in Transition in the spring semester of your first year narrows the broader focus of the first semester lectures into a smaller course focusing on field research. So in, when you're choosing courses for the spring semester, you will pick the section of China in Transition part two, led by a Peking University faculty member that you find most interesting and was potentially the most helpful for you in preparing for your master's thesis. That faculty member then will mm, guide you step-by-step step into designing, conducting, and writing up field research and the topic of your choosing. An added benefit of China in Transition Part 2 is that you will already have developed on the ground field research experience in the People's Republic of China, sort of as a test run before you get to conducting your own master's thesis research in the second year. Now, the second course is the field study 
This is a required academic excursion where all Yenjing scholars, generally in the fall semester of their first year, leave Beijing and go to another city in China. <clears throat> you obviously hit up some of the normal tourist sites. Um, previously, we would send our students to Xi'an. Last year, we sent our students to Chengdu in Sichuan province. So in Xi'an, you definitely go see the terracotta soldiers. In Chengdu, you definitely go see the pandas and eat spicy hot pot. But it's not just a, a tourist activity. You have guest lectures. You meet uh, local experts from universities, network with graduate students, go to visit sites of archaeological and historical significance, go meet business leaders and in important industries to that region. It is a course requirement, and you the course culminates in a reaction paper. And so it's a way that we try to not only get your learning experience outside of the classroom, but also outside of Beijing itself. For the Topic in China Studies lecture series, we have a series of um, guest lecturers come in over the course of your first academic year. They will be leaders in whatever field they are in that's broadly associated as China Studies. And they will give a roughly a two hour lecture. Um, then they'll stick around for some Q&A and you write a series of short reaction papers or a longer paper based on one of the lectures. Last year, we had a very, very exciting series of lecturers come in. We had a, um, the former chairman and CEO of China Mobile Corporation talk about China's historical development from 2, 3, and 4G and how the rollout of 5G will change China's domestic market as well as perhaps the global market. We had um, famous Chinese contemporary artist Xu Bing come and talk about his theory and practice of creating a, a style of art that is both noticeably Chinese, but also uh, legible to the viewer, not, regardless of what uh, culture or language the viewer may be from. We also had a um, leading scholar of ancient Chinese history come and talk about um, using network analysis to reassess the series of wars that led to the first unification of China during the Warring States period. So a really, really fascinating series of lectures. And then finally, you have academic writing. This is a year-long course um, of guest lectures and symposia and discussions by different Peking University faculty who give you guidance on the step-by-step -step process of designing, carrying out, and writing up your master's thesis research. This course culminates in the formal submission of your master's thesis research proposal at the end of your first academic year. Now, we also highly value and require language study for all of our scholars. International scholars will come and are required to take Chinese language courses for their entire first year. This will be four hours of classes per week, plus two hours of one-on-one -on -one work with a language tutor. Mainland Chinese scholars and scholars from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan are also required to take a second non-English foreign language during their first year. I would also like to point out for international scholars, you are able to place out of the Chinese language courses if you have completed the HSK level six. HSK is mainland China's standardized test for assessing Chinese language proficiency for non-native speakers. Level six is the highest level. If you have an HSK level six, then you can place out of the Chinese language courses, but you're still required to um, fulfill those academic credits. And we encourage all scholars who are at HSK level six to take at least one course per semester taught in Chinese in a different department or school. It's a very, very exciting opportunity, but also a big challenge. Okay, here you can see some of the cultural activities that Yanjing scholars get to participate in, in the fall field study course. The background photo, you see some of our scholars in Xi'an uh, practicing the Chinese art of shadow puppetry. In the foregrounded circle, you see one of our scholars practicing Sichuan opera at a uh, tea house in Chengdu. <clears throat> These are some of the sort of fun cultural activities that you get to do in the travel, the academic travel experience, the field study. In the spring, uh, field study, sort of field research course, part of China in Transition Part Two, uh, Yanjing Academy funds scholars to go out and conduct their field research projects. For instance, you can see in 2019, we had 30 different groups of scholars 
visit 15 provinces, cities, or regions in the People's Republic, all as part of the field research component, the second semester of China in Transition. I would also like to point out that we do have a separate independent research um, research grant called the Dean's Research Grant that scholars uh, can apply for competitively. They write a formal research proposal for a non-course related independent research project. And we assess the contribution that this product this project might make and its feasibility for a first year master's student and then fund uh, groups of scholars to conduct independent research in their first year. Yanjing Academy also emphasizes uh, training and development for some scholars who might be interested in exploring um, non-research or non-academic careers. Our colleagues in the Student Affairs Office uh, have a series of um, interesting extracurricular activities, generally in the evenings during the week. Um, some of them might be um, recruiting sessions. We have companies and international organizations come here every year to recruit Yanjing scholars for internships or uh, employment opportunities. Here you can see one of the vice presidents of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank visiting interested Yanjing scholars to talk about his experience in international development and to give advice for those who might be interested in pursuing a similar career. These are voluntary um, activities. And I think most Yanjing scholars in their first year quickly learn that you have to pick and choose the activities and events that are most interesting to you because there's just so much going on pretty much every day. Yanjing scholars in their first year are not allowed to have internships, but in the summer after your first year when your coursework is done or in the second year during your, the year that you're focusing on your master's thesis research, we encourage and support Yanjing scholars to find internship opportunities in Beijing or around China. Here you can see some of the uh, Chinese corporations or multinational corporations in China or international organizations, consultancies, et cetera, where Yanjing scholars have had uh, fruitful internship experiences. In general, scholars are able to find their own um, internship opportunities through personal networks, uh, networking activities, LinkedIn searches, et cetera. But if a scholar uh, is, needs some help, to find a internship opportunity that suits their needs. We're happy to use our institutional connections or word of mouth from locations where and organizations where previous Yanjing scholars have interned to help you get your foot in the door. Yanjing scholars have had a resounding success finding uh, productive ways of taking the next step in their career after graduating from Peking University. Roughly 30%, about a third of Yanjing scholars upon graduation, go on to further graduate study, perhaps in law school, med school, um, or at the doctoral level. You can see some of the top universities where Yanjing scholars have gone on for further study directly after graduation on the left. And you can see some of the corporations, international organizations that uh, Yanjing scholars have gone on to for employment upon graduation. What we're looking at here are the um, Yanjing Global Symposium. This is uh, Yanjing Academy's premier annual event. It is an international China studies conference uh, that is conceptualized, run and organized by Yanjing scholars. So we have had four highly successful uh, Yanjing Global Symposiums over the last five years, unfortunately. Um, the 2020 version of the Yanjing Global Symposium needed to be canceled. This takes place in late March, early April. And I think you can all remember um, that it just was not feasible uh, considering um, the global pandemic to bring people to Beijing. But YGS is conceptualized uh, by a group of, you know, Yanjing scholar volunteers. Um, they put up calls for papers, they, they determine the theme, put out a call for papers, review thousands of applications for uh, several hundred spots, um, organize uh, keynote speakers, uh, symposia, paper panels, breakout sessions, and then the academy itself funds um, these delegates and keynote speakers to come to Beijing for a long weekend and a very, very enriching opportunity. The 2021 Yanjing Global Symposium is moving ahead. We already have the student steering committee 
and they are currently working on their call for papers. We hope that it'll be in person or at least a combination of online and offline. But again, we'll just have to see how the um, pandemic um, runs its course before we make that decision. Okay, um, so let's look at some of the demographic data about um, Yenjing scholars from 2015 to 2020. So over the um, last six years, we have had over 650 scholars from just under 80 countries and regions join us, about 40% from Asia, a quarter from North America, just under a quarter from Europe, and um, just over 10% from Africa, Latin America, and Oceania. So when we say we are a multicultural uh, global community of young scholars, we certainly mean it. Over these last six years and six cohorts of Yanjing scholars, we've had students join us from uh, just under 300 universities from around the world. You can see some of the universities here from Columbia to Harvard to Leiden, NYU, uh, Cambridge, Chicago, et cetera, that have sent multiple scholars to join the Yanjing Academy program. Okay, so now we're back to research areas. Um, what you can see here is uh, the breakdown of um, the research areas that Yenjing scholars have chosen over the first six years of our program. 36% uh, have chosen politics and international relations, 33% uh, in economics and management, 15% law and society, and literature and culture, history and archaeology, philosophy and religion, the humanities, um, occupy um, just over 15%. Now, a couple of points that I want to make here. First, we do not prefer one research area over the other. What you're seeing here, this imbalance um, with more students choosing politics and international relations and economics and management than the others, is simply a reflection of the research areas that the most competitive applicants in each year chose. The second point I'd like to make is there's only one very, very specific and very small situation in which um, a research area might be decisive in whether someone gets accepted into the program or not. Um, and this is if we're down to the last offer uh, for admission in a year, and one, one person has chosen a research area that already has you know 30 people who have chosen that, and the other um, applicant has chosen a research area that has fewer people. If and only if those two applicants were equally competitive and equally excellent in all the other categories, would we perhaps say, well, let's select someone from the um, research area that has a lower number of applicants this year so that they can have a larger cohort of students uh, with whom to share ideas, discuss their research area, et cetera. Only in that very specific situation would um, selecting one research area advantage you or disadvantage your application. But it is important that you need to remember that over the course of the six years at Yanjing Academy, we have been increasingly evaluating um, a student's admission in relation to the research area they've chosen with a goal of ensuring that those who are accepted have the fundamental knowledge in the research area they've chosen to be successful conducting research at the graduate level in that field. So what does that mean? Um, let's say you're, you're all interested in, I assume you're all interested in applying to politics and international relations. Well, if you are a political science major or an IR major or global governance or global affairs, the kind of thing where you know, the major looks on the surface to be easily transferable to politics and international relations here at YCA. Okay, well, that makes sense. Of course, we're not just going to look at the title of your major or your minor in your undergraduate or perhaps previous master's degree work. We're obviously going to be also looking at the courses you've taken, your grades in those courses, um, any papers or publications you may have written, any internship or work experience you may have in the field, and does it and assess whether it connects to uh, the research area that you've chosen. Now, let's say you um, were an anthropology major and a Chinese language minor in your undergraduate studies, and you're now choosing politics and international relations. That's okay. 
we are, I am no, in no way saying that you should only apply to the research area that you already majored in or concentrated in during your undergraduate study. What I am suggesting is that if you think your undergraduate coursework or the title of your major or concentration on the surface will appear to be a major shift um, compared to what you're choosing to research at Yanjing Academy, well, then you should anticipate that we might have those questions. In your CV, make it clear that you have certain relevant experience. Mention that you took a certain series of courses. Mention that you have internship experience or professional experience that might connect to the research area you've chosen and therefore make you better prepared for graduate level research in that area. So just a, a bit of advice when you're uh, putting together your application materials. So you can see some of the educational backgrounds of the international Yanjing scholars over the last six cohorts of our program. Majority are um, have recently finished their bachelor's degree, or that is the highest level of education they have attended, or they have reached before coming to Yanjing Academy. But you can see that we also have a, a not insignificant number of uh, accepted Yanjing scholars who already have one master's degree. So we think that is a um, the kind of diversity in educational background also makes for a more lively and enriching student community at Yanjing Academy. Okay, so let's talk about your application. So we are a highly competitive, fully funded graduate program at China's top university. So an outstanding academic record is a requirement. You know, we are certainly going to be assessing your grades, your letters of recommendation, uh, your class rank, if that's appropriate or relevant uh, in your, um, your uh, educational background, um, papers you have written, any publications you may have. So we're really looking for an outstanding academic record. But that's not all we focus on. So um, if there are extracurricular activities that you have dedicated a lot of time and energy to that you think have helped define who you are as a young scholar, and that maybe will give you specific skills or experiences that you can then contribute to our community, tell us about them. We want to know and we value that. Um, are you an athlete? Were you in student government? Are you an artist or musician? Have you created a startup company? Um, were you dedicated to community service? Um, these are the kinds of things that we also value in prospective Yanjing scholars. Since we are so culturally, linguistically, um, nationally diverse, you know, we do appreciate applicants who have experience in cross-cultural education, or at least are interested in exploring diverse cultures. You know, we certainly believe that this multicultural, international uh, academic community brings a lot of really amazing opportunities for mutual understanding and for uh, changing your perspective. But it also brings some challenges. So we want, uh, we appreciate scholars who have experience or the kind of open mind that you need to be a productive member of a truly diverse multicultural academic community. We are a China studies program. And so we value applicants who have previous experience or academic training in East Asian studies, Chinese studies, Chinese language studies, studying abroad in China. These are uh, potential advantages but they are not requirements. You know, if China studies has already been a large portion of your academic life, wonderful, you know, tell us about it, emphasize that. But you don't have to be a China studies minor or a East Asian languages and literatures major to be accepted to the Yanjing Academy. In fact, every year we have a, a large portion or a significant portion of accepted Yanjing scholars who are um, who have excelled in another field, maybe in economics, or maybe in um, <clears throat> international relations, or maybe in uh, political science, but have not yet fully started to explore their field in relation to China. And so in a sense, they're interested in making a sort of lateral move of, you know, taking what they've learned in another field and figuring out how what they've learned in another field it's applicable to 
or is challenged by or should be should cause reconsideration and more thought by similar situations happening in China. That is also a, a potentially very effective application that you can make. So it's great if you are a budding China scholar already, we welcome those applicants, but you don't have to be. We also welcome applicants who have just now realized that for their future career <clears throat> or their future study, they need to know more about China. And just like any undergraduate application, any internship, any job application, any other graduate school application. We want to know why you're interested in Yanjing Academy. Why do you want to study China in China? And why do you wanna do this now at this stage in your career? We also wanna know what are your career plans? You know, Where do you see yourself going in the medium or in the long-term? And how do you think a master's degree from Peking University and two years of the interdisciplinary study of China in a diverse group of young scholars will help you achieve those goals. Of course, since we are an English uh, taught program, um, if you uh, are a non-native English speaker <clears throat> and if you did not attend a university that was taught in English, then we will need to see certificates of English proficiency. Okay, so, there are a couple of specifics that I need to talk to you about now. So um, mainland Chinese students are, have, have one specific way that they can apply to the Yanjing Academy. And these are rules set by the Ministry of Education, not just by Yanjing Academy or Peking University. M scholars who are PRC citizens uh, must have attended a Chinese university and must have achieved um, a certain kind of qualification called they will be recommended by their home school, their home department at their university to skip the national graduate entrance examination. Unfortunately, this is the only option currently for PRC citizens to apply to the Engine Academy. If this applies to you, uh, please go to our website um, flip over to the Chinese language version of the website and you'll see uh, the information that you need to know there. Scholars from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan have an extra step, an extra application process that they also need to follow. So they will apply to the Yanjing Academy's online application portal, uh, just like international scholars will apply to the application portal. And I'll tell you about that on the next slide. But scholars from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan also must fill out a separate application on PKU's website. And this is an application process specifically for scholars from the regions of Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. Um, you must complete this. And the deadline for completing the PKU application is the same day as completing the Yanjing Academy application. So one extra step for scholars from Hong Kong, Macau, or Taiwan. <clears throat> now the minimum qualification for consideration um, to be admitted to Yanjing Academy is completing your bachelor's degree no later than the end of August next year. <clears throat> Pardon me. Okay, application deadline is December 4th, 2020, 12 o'clock noon, Beijing time. 12 o'clock noon, Beijing time. So please be sure about that. Um, check the time difference from where you are and be sure to complete your application by 12 p.m. noon, Beijing time. You'll do your application at yanjingacademy.pku.edu.cn. If you are a non-native English speaker and did not attend a university or graduate program taught in English, <clears throat> we will need to see a certificate of English proficiency IELTS, TOEFL, Cambridge, etc. Um, we recognize that there are some challenges this year because of the coronavirus pandemic, that the schedules and a lot of the testing opportunities, both for the HSK and for these standardized English proficiency tests, um, that that has caused some testing difficulties. We understand that, but this is still a requirement. If you're having any specific difficulties about this, please reach out to us at our email, which I'll show you on the next couple of slides. We will need to see your certificate of enrollment for your current um, institution of higher education. 
If you are a fourth year student in your undergraduate study, we know that you won't have a diploma yet, but we will need to see the standard official document from your university stating that you are currently enrolled and that you are on progress to graduate by next, you know, by the end of uh, August of next year. We need to see your official transcript. And I want to say that the diplomas and certificates of enrollment or in the official transcripts are required for all institutions of higher education that you've attended. So if you <clears throat> completed your undergraduate work and are currently in a master's program or law school, we need to see these from both of those institutions. We need to see a personal statement in English, maximum of 750 words. This is your personal introduction to us, who you are, uh, what you can bring to the, the community of Yanjing scholars, um, what your career goals are, why you want to study with us, um, why you're interested in studying China in China at this point in your career. This year, we have a new uh, application requirement. This is a research proposal, maximum of one page. If the personal statement is your personal introduction to us, the research proposal is your statement of academic interest. This is you introducing yourself to us as a young scholar. What are you interested in studying? What might you, what problems might you try to address in your master's thesis? Um, are there any questions that are, that are um, really stoking your curiosity? And how do you think you might be able to begin to answer those questions through master's thesis research? Now, of course, we do not expect and we do not require that your research proposal and the application will be the exact same thing that you end up writing your thesis on. But we do want to think, see how you conceptualize and write about your research interests. We need to see your resume or CV. And finally, we need to see two letters of recommendation, academic references. And per the Ministry of Education in China and per Peking University's requirement, they must be from associate professors or full professors or higher. Now we understand that you know this associate full professor is not the system at every university around the world. We understand the equivalence. And if you have questions, you can um, hop on our website for the Q&A, frequently asked questions or send us an email. But both letters must be academic references and they must be from the associate or full professor level or higher. If you have other letter or other reference writers that you'd like to have, to have uh, add to your application package, and they are assistant professors or lecturers or internship managers, et cetera, you can still submit them as supplemental documents, but they cannot replace the two academic letters of recommendation. Okay, <clears throat> this is the last slide. Before I wrap up, I have a couple of bits of advice. First, go to our website, yanjingacademy.pku.edu.cn. Learn about our curriculum, learn more about our application process, learn about the faculty who, who teach here with us um, in the core courses, and go to the profiles of current and former Yanjing scholars. I hope it'll be inspiring. I hope it'll give you some good ideas, but I also hope that by doing so, you can see that this is not a one size fits all master's program. And we are not looking for one profile or one type of um, applicant into the program. When you look at the profiles of current and former Yanjing scholars, you can see that there are people from all over the world, from different academic backgrounds. Some are coming right out of their undergraduate university. Some have graduated their, with their bachelor's and have been working for a few years. Some are coming from a law degree or from another master's program. And they were able to, with very, very different academic training and different professional experiences, make it into the program and are doing very, very interesting projects while they're here. If you have questions and you can't get those questions from our website or um, from our presentation today, then send us an email, yca-admissions at pku.edu.cn. And if you're using WeChat, please feel free to scan the QR code on the right-hand side. Uh, follow our official WeChat account and um, learn more about what's going on at the Yanjing Academy. Okay, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, that is the end of my presentation. Coming up next, we're going to have um, a current Yanjing scholar who is working on her master's thesis now in her second year. 
uh, Natasha Locke is going to step to the microphone and share a little bit uh, about her experience at Yanjing Academy. Thank you so much for joining us, Natasha. Hi there, are you able, am I, am I on screen? You are on screen now and give me a second, I'm stopping sharing my screen. So you should probably be able to share your screen now. Fantastic. I think actually the office is sharing screen for this part. So if, if that could happen. Are one of our colleagues sharing the screen for Natasha's PowerPoint presentation. Oh, okay. I will uh, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead and share Natasha. Sorry about that, everyone. Just one moment. Okay, fantastic. Sorry, I, I wasn't aware that I was doing that. So let me just get that showing. Fantastic. Hi there, everyone. It's so great to see so many of you here today. Um, as Brent said, I'm Natasha, and I'm a current student at the Yenjing Academy. Um, I'm in the fifth cohort, and I'm in the second year of the program. I'm from the UK, and um, I went to Exeter University in the UK before starting at the Yenjing Academy. So I um, got my bachelor degrees there in history, international relations, and Mandarin Chinese. Um, I spent a year of my bachelor's degree actually at Peking University. So I did a year of exchange study there, which was really fantastic and definitely something that spurred me on to, to come to Yenjing and to apply for Yenjing. Um, whilst I was an undergrad, I also had um, study abroad experience at a few other universities. Um, just to get some international experience and some perspectives really from all over the world. That's definitely what spurred my interest in, in going abroad. Um, whilst, oh, well, before coming to Yenjing, I actually took a year out before um, starting. So during that time, I was a high school teacher in Suzhou in, in China, which is a beautiful area of China for anyone who's been before, and also worked in a manufacturing company down in, in Guangdong province province, which was certainly an interesting experience to say the least. Um, as Brent said, there's massive opportunity whilst you are at Yenjing to get involved with work or internship experience alongside your master's programme. This is particularly something that scholars focus on in the summer after their first year or in the second year of their degree. So um, I've been working as a freelance writer at the Beijing Review. Um, I'm currently a teaching assistant at Peking University, which is an incredible experience um, that you can get involved in in your second year of, of the program. Um, I work as a voluntary teacher at Educating Girls of Rural China, which is a charity based in China, uh, which focuses on educating girls um, who live in rural Gansu province. Um, I work as an ambassador for SUP China, which is a really good news agency that you should definitely check out if you're expressing interest in, in doing further study in China. Um, post YCA, as Brent said, a lot of scholars go in all kinds of directions. So at the moment, I'm applying for PhD programs um, to commence in September 2021. And um, yeah, just a couple of personal interests there. So anything involving adventure, really. I love traveling and trekking and languages. So what was it that motivated me to apply for YCA? So when I was sat in your seat kind of two years ago now, um, these were the kind of things that were really making me think that YCA was definitely the best program to enhance my own academic future. So the first was definitely to further my China experience. YCA gives you an unprecedented experience to explore China, to be based in China and watch China unfold before your eyes. Um, moreover, it was the ability or the opportunity to join a like-minded, focused and diverse community of scholars. You have scholars joining from all over the world, so it really does build a, a very vibrant community like no other really to be, to be studying your master's in. I wanted to get a Chinese perspective of IR and for anyone who's on this call today who's interested in going down the IR or politics track, I think it's very, very in interesting and important also, if you are studying Chinese politics or international relations in China, it's really interesting to get this nuanced Chinese perspective from when you are studying politics. 
Moreover, it's the highest regarded academic institution covering China or China studies. So of course that was a, a great opportunity to apply for YCA and definitely something that motivated me to, to put my application in. This is some of the experience that I've had as a Yenjing scholar. Um, as Brent said, it's a really kind of interdisciplinary curriculum. So whilst my track at YCA has been IR and politics, I've also had the ability to go down different routes. So I've taken a module in archaeology, one in economics called the Chinese thinking of, uh, or the economic thinking of Chinese entrepreneurs, which was a fantastic opportunity to just build a different perspective alongside um, my IR and politics track. Um, also the ability to look at Sino-Australian studies, something that I would have never had the opportunity to do had I been based, you know, doing a master's here in the UK. Um, as a Yenjing scholar, obviously I've, I've made a network of friends at Yenjing from all over the world, and it sounds cheesy, but really some friends for life. Um, it's been incredible just kind of traveling in the first part of January that you have got friends all over the world that you can meet up for in pretty much any city and catch up with. So that's a, a wonderful thing about being a Yenjing scholar. You have incredible field trips and travel opportunities. Um, this time last year, actually, we were in Chengdu, which was an incredible experience, um, not only to see Chengdu and the pandas and some of the cultural traditions of the province, but also um, to conduct field research trips, which was fascinating. We went to um, museums such as Sanxingdui, which have got a, a huge you know, history and, and place in understanding China. You'll have access to the beautiful university campus. If, if you haven't been before, I would suggest you look it up online because it's just a campus like no other really. It holds an incredibly special place in my heart for it's just beautiful, beautiful grounds. Um, it used to form as one of the old imperial gardens. So you can definitely see that when you're walking around campus. Also, you'll have access to Beijing, an incredible city that's kind of this, this, um, this mismatch of fast pace and slow pace, um, an incredible place to be in, in this exciting time of your life. There's amazing research opportunities that you can do at Yenjing. Some of, some of the ones that I'll talk about in the next slide, um, we're looking at the growing domestic red wine market in Beijing, um, bottom-up perspectives from the Belt and Road Initiative. And here, this was um, a course of empirical research. So we were able to go to some of these provinces and interview people firsthand and see what their perspectives were from, from this Belt and Road Initiative. Art repatriation and how this is playing into China's foreign policy. And um, more recently, whilst I've been joining YCA remotely, I've been looking at the implication of the Black Death on the Yuan Dynasty. So something that's very topical in today's world of, of pandemics and all sorts. Of course, you also have access to delicious Chinese food, definitely a, a cultural part of living in China. Dian Bing's hot pot and Biang Biang noodles, which I put there, are the most complicated character in Chinese. So have a go on that if you have, if you have some spare time. Thesis wise, Again, you've got opportunities to explore all sorts. And, and as Brent said, it's amazing how everyone is approaching politics and IR who are on this track from such different perspectives and such, such different topic um, research areas as well. So my own thesis is looking at how historical narratives play into contemporary foreign policy. I'm looking at China and I hope to continue this on um, through PhD studies, looking at other nations as well, particularly how the component of victimhood is used in, in today's political narratives around the world. But just to give you an idea um, of the other stuff that I've been looking at and kind of the, the broadness of what you can be looking at, anything from nationalism with Chinese characteristics to Nihao Australia, bilingualism in practice within the 21st century, um, grandparenting, a study into the role of grandparents in contemporary China, and coffee production and coffee culture, China's new taste, assessing this and, and what this will mean for the future of China. So you can see there's, there's definitely areas to explore and, and um, some great opportunities to be had. So I guess that's my experience of Yenjing and, and the incredible time that I've had there and just the, the amount of things and the amount of opportunities that have been available studying at Yenjing have just been, you know, truly incredible. It's been an amazing experience for me. Um, and this would be my advice to, to you all tuning in at the moment. So some suggestions to prospective students here. So when you're writing your application, keep these kind of thoughts in mind from this slide. 
the first would be why China? Why, why China for you, right? So pinpoint what you want to research or learn and why you need to be in China specifically to do that. Following on from that, a really interesting question to be thinking about when you're writing your, your personal statements and your research statements would be, why China now? Both on a personal level, why China for you now? Is it about language for you and, and building on your Mandarin or starting Mandarin if you haven't, if you, haven't um, you know, studied it before? Or is it to build a Chinese perspective of international relations like I talked about earlier, which was definitely my motive for applying for Yenjing? Also, think about this on an international level. Why is a further understanding of China important for your future? You know, China's rise is unprecedented. There's so many opportunities that are out there in, in all necks of the woods, all over the world, um, to cover China and to bring your own expertise in of being a Chinese expert in your future. So what will this help? Why will being in China and being at the Yenjing Academy, the highest regarded institution covering the rise of China, be beneficial or be imperative for your own future and, and your own desires of what you want to achieve? Why specifically the YCA program? Outline your appreciation and aptitude for the interdisciplinary and intercultural study. You know, look at the YCA website, look at the um, kind of core modules that Brent discussed in, in his earlier PowerPoint. These are all important things. So the YCA office understands that you have done your research and, and you do understand why YCA will hone in your research skills. And finally, why me? Keep thinking this when you're writing your application. You know, explore previous scholar profiles on the YCA website and make a case for what you could add to the next cohort of YCA scholars. It's not a cookie cutter that everyone's the same. Everyone's incredibly different on the program. So really think about these three, these three C's, your commitment, demonstrate that you're committed to further study um, with a Chinese angle in there. Demonstrate your charisma. You know, everyone brings something totally different to the table, be it a sporting interest or a musical interest, something that makes you different and everyone's got that. And finally, keep thinking to yourself, how will this interest in China or this Chinese perspective be beneficial to you and be beneficial to YCA to have you there to study with them? Good luck, everyone. I hope you decide to join the YCA family and yeah. Thank you so much, Natasha. Uh, I really like your three C's that you mentioned at the very end, uh, commitment, charisma, and China. That's a very, very pithy and very effective uh, way of, of keeping a, a good application strategy in mind. So well done, I appreciate it. Um, okay, I uh, hope you can stick around a little bit because uh, we have some questions coming up. And if there are any questions that are directed to uh, the best that you're best suited to answer or perhaps our next presenter will be if you're still around we'd love to have you join us uh, now uh, we'd like to have uh, kazuki miyazaki from the 2018 cohort of yenjing scholars uh, join us to um, share his experiences in a presentation welcome thank you very much hi hi everyone i'm kazuki so i'm gonna share the presentation from my laptop Can you guys see the presentation, right? All right, so um, I'm Kazuki and I was in Yanqing from 2018 to 2020 as a fourth cohort. So I just graduated this year in July and I was doing projects and IR in Yanqing. And after the graduation, now I'm working for the Ministry of the Environment at the government of Japan. So, the other things I want to talk about today and share with you all. So I want to first mention like who I was before YCA to share like what kind of person I was and I got in Yanqin. So I'm from Japan and I did my undergrad in Waseda University, which is in Tokyo. And I did IR major and I did minor in peace studies, especially about like international uh, relations in Asia. And I had worked for an uh, international NGO called Asian Network for Free Elections, which does international election observation missions across Asia. So I was in like Thailand, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar and working there for the elections. And I was also working for UNDP for half a year as a PR. And as experiences, uh, I have studied abroad in the US for one year as an exchange student. 
and I did one semester study in China as well. And I, ha I have attended the Yanqing Global Symposium, which Brent also mentioned in his presentation in 2018. And that was before I got into Yanqing. And I like to travel. So I have done so many backpacking to like 20 some countries. And I you know, went to see some like, uh, mostly in developing countries about to see uh, global issues or like uh, developing issues in those countries. So I have a passion and I have the passion that I want to build a more sustainable peace in Asia. And that's why I came to get interested in China because China just like matters uh, no matter what field you work on in Asia or like in the world or politics or business or society, like China just really matters. That's why I was uh, interested in China. So my motivation to apply for YCA, so there are mainly three things. First was learning about China in China. Uh, I think Brent and Natasha also mentioned already, like studying China in China is very important because I studied about China in the US, in Japan and in China before coming to YCA. And I thought oh, China is just so diverse that you cannot really, um, you know, if you want to understand China well, you also have to see China from Chinese perspectives or like many kinds of perspectives because China is just so diverse. So I thought learning about China in China is just so great. Second is friendship and network with amazing people. So Yanjing has so many like amazing, interesting people from around the world. And I was just, I was just, I wanted to uh, get to know, I just wanted to get to know them and um, live with them and learn with them, discuss with them. And third is general support. Uh, I always wanted to study abroad and I do uh, my master studies abroad, but always uh, there's a financial problem, right? And Yan Chin Daddy has general support for students. So uh, they were the main uh, motivations for me to apply for YCA. So I want to uh, introduce like four experiences as a Yan Chin scholar. Um, yeah. So diverse curriculum. Um, as I two already like mentioned a lot, so I want to show more like my concrete uh, experience as a Yanji scholar. So there are the classes I took in my first year, and uh, I mean many kind of classes, mostly about IR. But what I want to point out is that you can like study what you want, like not just about IR or politics, even though you belong to that concentration. But you can also take classes from like business or like sociology. It just depends on you. And um, your, concentr your concentration matters when you write your thesis in the second year. And I did my thesis on Japanese people's public view on China. Right. And then second point is field trips. So um, yeah, I mean, there are many field trips in Yanqing. And I think I'm the, I'm the one who joined the field trips the most in Yanqing. I joined 14 field trips. I went to 19 cities and I spent 43 days in total. And every time you go with classes or you go with a cohort or you go with your research group and you uh, see those kind of things. Sometimes you go to the factory, like advanced like, like factory uh, which is equipped with um, those like high-tech robots. Or sometime uh, we went to uh, Hangzhou, which hosted G20 Summit in 2016. Sometime we went to like tech uh, gaming company in, I think in Guangzhou or something. And we, I also went to the BRI project uh, construction site in Yunnan province. So there are many kind of uh, field trips like this and you can really learn China, not just by classes, but also by this kind of uh, experiences. Uh, events were also nice experience. So Yanqin hosts many like seasonal events or like, parties every year. Uh, it could be about like Chinese traditional parties like Mid Autumn Festival, uh, Chinese Spring, like, spring Festival, uh, many kind of thing. And sometimes, because we have many, many scholars from uh, many countries, we celebrate uh, the uh, event as well. Sometimes Mexican, sometimes Russian, sometimes American, sometimes Japanese, like anything. 
So we have uh, we had a lot of fun, and uh, we have symposium, Yanjing Global Symposium, and since our uh, symposium accepts so many delegates from other countries, from other places, young professionals or like scholars, uh, we can uh, discuss with them and can be friends with them. And Yanjin invited many guest speakers almost every week, I think, uh, sometimes from political fields, sometimes from business. study or like something serious sometimes you also do like cultural things like maybe you had a, have a workshop about Chinese uh, like tea or like sometimes you have a Chinese opera and then you try to experience it you have to write your thesis. But at the same time, like, of course you do research and I did research, but you can also do what you want, what you want to try. Some people do research, some people do internships, some people start working, uh, some people study Chinese. And I did my own project, which I called Middle Kingdom, Middle Kingdom Adventure. So that was about I traveled to all the provinces and all the UNESCO World Heritages in China in the whole second year. So in conclusion, um, uh, what I like about YCA, so the first is, as I've been mentioning, uh, amazing fellow scholars and the sense of the community. So just, I was just so happy to be surrounded with amazing scholars, amazing friends, and um, Yanjin has a sense of the community. It's not just a program you study, but it's more about like Natasha in the last slide of the uh, presentation mentioned like come join the Yanjin family. But I think like Yanjin really has that kind of sense like we are Yanjin and we have the sense of the community. We belong together and work together. And second was uh, environment, which sets your standard higher. So what I mean by this is, so Yanchi has many like achieving scholars, hardworking scholars, smart scholars. They do something great or something impressive. So if you're in Yanchi, you just get used to it and you thought something is great before, but what you thought great before is not like so great anymore because you're surrounded by you know, greater people. So you just set your standards higher and you can, you know, like you get used to it and you try to do even more and better Right. The third is opportunities to understand China deeper from any angles and experiences. So as I've been saying, um, you can learn about China in China, not only by classes, but also by like many kinds of things, travel, field trips, workshop, guest speakers, friends, event. So that's really important. Uh, fourth is flexibility or freedom to try anything. So you really just really depends on you like you do your research but at the same time it's that the program is really flexible for you to try anything and you get enough support from the program so that's the last part um, general support so you can get like enough financial support to live and I mean to be honest I really think like you don't really need your money out of your pocket to finish this program because the support is just so generous for you. And it's really uh, nice for you to pursue your passion and interest in the program and in Beijing. So if you are interested, uh, I really hope you come join us. And yeah, so come join us in Beijing. Thank you. All right, Kazuki, thank you very much. Um, you know, I enjoy and I'm interested in a lot of Yanjing scholars uh, research and their extracurricular projects, but I have to say your uh, Middle Kingdom uh, travel project was uh, pretty cool. Um, <laughs> so really well done, well done on that.
Um, okay, so we have a lot of questions to get to. And so I'm gonna go through and try to address some of them in the order we receive them. Just so you know, some of the ones that we plan to answer live have unfortunately been moved over to the answered section, even though they weren't. So I'm gonna be jumping back and forth between them to try to answer the questions in the order they came in. So we had one question that came in and the it's already in the answered section, but it was what qualities do Yen, does Yenjing prioritize for their prospective students in the admission selection and interview? Um, so we have some guidelines for that on our website and I really encourage you to, to look at that. But certainly um, the handful of qualities that we generally um, value are academic excellence, leadership potential, commitment to service, sort of giving back to your community, um, interest in China or training in China, um, multicultural experience or interest in and commitment to uh, multicultural uh, experiences and, and learning environments. And then also, um, you know, career goals and how you conceptualize studying with us at Yanjing Academy will help you achieve those career goals. So these are five or six very, very general categories. Um, and in some ways you should certainly pay attention to those categories and, and emphasize your strengths within those, but you don't need to feel completely restricted to only those five or six categories. Um, in general, when you're writing an application, you know, the most successful application packages that I've seen are ones that tend to tell a cohesive story about who you are, what you want to study here, or who you are, why you want to study here, what you want to research here, where you want to go in your career and how we can help you achieve those goals. Um, so as I said, this is not a one size fits all program and there is not a one size fits all type or profile of the student we're looking for as a successful applicant, but those five or six um, areas are things that we prioritize and we value in Yenjing and applicants to the Yenjing Academy. Um, Kazuki, Natasha, is there anything you would like to add to that before I move on to the next one? I would say really kind of focus and hone in on, on that, the three C's that I said, so the, the commitment, the China focus and the charisma, so what you're going to bring as well. Yeah, uh, the three C's, uh, that was really good. I wouldn't be surprised if we, if you see that on our website next year. Um, so thanks, thanks Natasha. Um, okay, we have another question coming up. Uh, this was at 847 and this is again in the you know, mislabeled in the answered section. Um, one, one person at 847 asked, would applying to a specialization that I did not do my undergraduate or career in put me at a disadvantage? Um, so that's a good question. And this is, this is talking about, you know, your preparation for uh, the research area you choose. Um, to be frank, if you have no academic training and no internship or professional experience in the research area to which you were applying, yes, that would put you at a disadvantage. Um, if you think about it, um, this, is, this is a graduate program. So, you know, it would be very difficult to apply to med school if you had no training in biology or no pre-med coursework. Similarly, at law school, if you had no training in pre-law or no previous internship experience that would give you any experience in the research area to which you're focusing. So that I'm answering your question initially from a very extreme perspective. Yes, if you have no training at all, professional or academic, then yes, that will put you at the disadvantage. But there's a lot of shades of gray in this as well. So um, for instance, it's you know, politics and international relations, somewhat, but really economics and management is certainly going to be one of the areas that has a higher level of fundamental knowledge that any graduate program is going to assume and require you have. You know, so if you were a comparative literature major and you're applying to economics and management, you know, we will then look through your transcript and say, huh, 
does this applicant have have they taken microeconomics, macroeconomics, statistical analysis, business management? Are there any courses in this applicant's um, academic record that suggests they're ready to uh, conduct research at the graduate level in this field? So that's one of the biggest jumps from a you know a literature or a, a humanities to economics and management. Um, politics and international relations is has less you know required previous knowledge um, in mathematics and economics, but it still does have some, you know, but then politics and international relations is also, it also includes multiple fields of academic inquiry. So for if you're doing politics and international relations, and you're interested in more of an IR focused topic, then, you know, we will be wondering, have you taken any you know, courses that will make you familiar with, say, the major theories of international relations, you know, realist theory, et cetera. These are some things that we'll need to look into um, because that's the kind of knowledge that you will certainly need to have uh, in order to successfully write a master's thesis in that field. But if you are, if you study minored in political science, well, then, you know, that certainly is going to, to make sense for applying to politics and international relations. So you don't have to be a major and you don't have to have majored in political science or international relations or international diplomacy or interned at the UN to be able to get into our program in the politics and IR uh, research area. Um, but if you perhaps didn't focus on this in your undergraduate study or another master's program, then you know having internship experience in this field can help a lot. Um, so this is, you know, in the extreme case, I do not recommend that you apply to a research area for which you have zero training or zero experience. Um, if you maybe, let's say, majored in Chinese studies and minored in business management, then you can still apply to economics and management, but just emphasize in your um, research proposal that you're looking more on the uh, HR or management perspective, and not so much in the, um, you know, regression analysis, you know, pure data economic side. So it's really about finding that, um, that sweet spot between what you've, tr what you have experience in and what you've been trained for, and what you're really passionate about and interested in studying at the graduate level. Um, Okay, I'm gonna look for the next one. Um, Kazuki or Natasha, is there anything you would like to add uh, to my answer there? Okay. Okay, so we have a couple of questions, one in the open and one in the answer that both came in around nine o'clock and it's about studying abroad or exchange opportunities as a Yanjing scholar. Um, so yes, there are study abroad or exchange opportunities for Yanjing scholars um, in the second year or the summer after your first year. You must be on campus living in the Yanjing Academy house and focusing on your coursework in the first year. In the second year, this is an option. Um, it is uh, certainly one that um, scholars from mainland China, from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan are able to take advantage of. Um, many of these exchange opportunities are through the Peking University Office of International Relations. There's only one or two that are specific to Yanjing Academy. We have one with Trinity College. Um, we have one with Cornell University. Uh, I believe that those are open to perhaps, we'll have to double check, perhaps only open to mainland Chinese scholars. I'd have to double check that. And the reason why I'm not, I'm not specifically sure about that is if you're coming to China for a fully funded two-year master's program, I would strongly encourage you to spend those two years in China, not come to China for one year and then go do an exchange program uh, for a semester in the second year. That is my advice. It, that seems to me to be um, a waste of a great opportunity because believe me, I've been here for almost 20 years now or you know, 15 out of 20 years. Um, and you will not know everything you can learn about China in a year and a half or two years here. Um, 
that's that's just certainly not possible but those opportunities are available i would um if someone was interested in doing that after being accepted into the program i would encourage you to come talk to me or come talk to your faculty advisor or other staff and faculty at Yenching academy to discuss those plans and make sure that that's really the best thing uh, the best option for you okay um anything that our two Yenjing scholars would like to add if not i will yeah. Yeah. okay I, both of you <laughs> okay <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to mention like some of my friends have studied abroad uh, when they were in Yanqin. Some people went to like Japan, Germany, uh, Japan, Germany, UK, US, Netherlands, those kind of countries. So if you really want, you can do it from Yanqin as well. Yeah, what I'd add to that as well is um, there's so many opportunities whilst you're at Yanjing to get grants and funding to go to conferences abroad or short programs during the summer. So I wouldn't necessarily, you know, set your eyes on going abroad for a whole semester exchange. And I, I don't think many people want to do it once they've had a year at the Yanjing Academy because they'd prefer just to stay in Beijing. So um, what I would add is constantly you have scholars going away to you know all over the world for a week conference or a two-week summer school program there's many opportunities for this and a lot of scholars end up doing that during their summers or even in term time just you know going off for a week somewhere uh, both good points um, thanks for for adding that both Kazuki and Natasha um, I would second um, what Natasha said at the end um, we have opportunity grants to present papers and attend international academic conferences. Um, we also, you know, in the second year, um, some Yanjing scholars have internships that are not based in Beijing, or perhaps their research requires them to go to another city or another region in China, or sometimes even outside of China. Even if you are um, res plan to be in residence in Beijing for your second year, you have um, 90 days in your second year that no question in your second year that no questions asked you can be outside of Beijing and that's intended for conducting your research. So if someone was really interested in quote unquote studying abroad while they were here, I one, I would discourage you from doing that if it if you unless it's connected to your master's thesis. And you don't have to be a full on exchange student at another graduate program around the world. Um, unless, you know, it really does make sense. If you're doing a, a China-Japan um, master's thesis research topic, then maybe that does make sense for you to spend some significant time in Tokyo or somewhere else in Japan. But it really just depends on uh, what the opportunity is and what you're doing for your, your master's thesis research. Um, okay, uh, a couple of, we have a couple of questions on age uh, for applications here. Uh, questions are, you know, is it a is it a hard, you know, cut off at over 28, you can't be accepted or or will older applicants be um, at a disadvantage in applying? Um, you know, we don't have a formal rule that says over the age of X, you cannot be admitted to the Engine Academy, but we have never admitted anyone over the age of 28. Um, we will still review your application. Um, but the reason why that, you know, we want to build a sense of community among Yanjing scholars, among each cohort and across cohorts of Yanjing scholars. And currently, the only way for mainland Chinese scholars to apply to the program is directly after their undergraduate bachelor degree wraps up. And so most of them will be coming in at around 22 years old. And so with an eye to having you know, a cohesive community, we have not had anyone come in over the age of 28. But for someone to be 25, 26, you know, that, that's, you know, very common, um, not just at Yanjing Academy, but in a lot of master's programs. Um, another question on research area. Uh, someone at 9.15 p.m. asked if it's possible to change the research focus in the middle of the course of study. Um, so yes, it is possible, but there is a process that you have to go through. Um, so what is this process? And this will have changed. Um, we've just implemented a new series of um, 
you know, processes and evaluation standards that did not apply to Kazuki or Natasha's time here. Um, so yes, you do need to, you can apply, you can apply to switch your master's thesis research area, say from history and archaeology to politics and international relations. Um, but you need to meet a series, uh, there are a series of criteria um, that we will use to evaluate your application. Criteria number one is we will look at your coursework, your academic coursework in the field to which you are applying. That will include your undergraduate coursework, that will include other graduate programs, and that will include your time at Yanjing Academy. And so if someone maybe thinks they might be interested in switching a research area in their first year, my advice to that scholar would be take some courses in your first and second semester in your first year in the other the new research area to which you might want to apply that will not only help you fulfill those requirements to have your application approved but also if you're thinking of switching there then you're probably already interested in that research area and it's probably going to make you a more well-rounded scholar and make you better trained for whatever master's thesis research topic you do secondly you will need to have a mass a thesis advisor in that new research area approve of you switching and be willing to be your advisor so that means you will need to be reaching out to scholars in that field either through courses you've taken or through um, our connections at the university reaching out and getting to know faculty members in that field to find someone who's willing to be your thesis advisor Finally, you will need um, a letter of support or a you know, written indication of agreement from another faculty member in that new research area into which you're hoping to switch. So it's not sufficient to just have one faculty member in that area be willing to be your thesis advisor. You also need to branch out more than just your thesis advisor to get to know other faculty members, perhaps from courses you've taken, just so you're getting a, a wider perspective and you have it more indicates you have more familiarity with the field into which you're trying to switch. So yes, that is possible, but we are with an eye of you know ensuring that you can be successful in the new field you're switching into. We do have another series of uh, evaluations uh, in your application. Okay, anything Natasha or Kazuki would like to add to that? Perhaps just um, really this is where the research component of the application comes in. Really think about is this something you really are committed to before, before you submit your application because it should be a case of you're applying on that track because that's exactly what you want to do for your graduate studies. So I just I just say really kind of assess your application as you're as you're going along with it and really make sure that this is exactly the track that you want to go on. Of course changes come about but yeah. Thanks for that, Natasha. Um, we have a series of other questions coming up that are related to um, which field should I choose and about the research proposal component. So I think uh, we'll try to address some of those questions here. Um, so one scholar asked um, that this scholar is interested in the internationalization of China's companies and China's business relations with other countries. Would the politics, international relations or economics and management be more suitable? That's a good question. And, you know, that's really up to you. It's up to you by how you might want to address or how you might want to try to learn more about the internationalization of China's companies and China's business relations with other countries. It also is that balancing act of what really is interesting to you and what have you already been trained in? You know, so if this uh, potential applicant has, um, you know, more of a training in, you know, international relations, sort of uh, international law, um, global governance, then perhaps you would be better suited to apply for politics and international relations and tailor your research, your research proposal statement more along those lines. But if you have more of a background in business management or finance or, you know, that, you know, economic side, then perhaps you're better suited to apply, you'll be more competitive applying for economics and management. But either way, if you applied for economics and management, you could have an 
econ or economics and management research project that is tilting towards international relations. Similarly, you could have an international relations research project that's tilting more towards economic side. I, I've used this example in other um, um, online info sessions. It's like if you are, let's say someone is interested in comparing and contrasting two, you know, periods of Chinese economic success and Chinese economic influence around the world. The high Qing of the long 18th century, um, when China was, uh, you know, responsible for over 30% of global GDP, and today's China, where China over the last 20 years is really becoming a major economic powerhouse. Let's say you were interested in comparing and contrasting those two periods of economic influence. What are the similarities? What are the differences? Well, should that be history and archaeology, or should that be economics and management? It really depends on what you're interested in and what the questions are that you would try to answer. You know, if you chose history and archaeology, then it would be an economics inflected history and archaeology project. Or if you chose economics and management, it could be a history inflected economics and management research project. Which one should you choose? Well, what are you more interested in? What are you better trained in? That's up to you. It's all depending on how you present this. So I hope this indirectly answers uh, this um, interested applicant's question about business relations and internationalization of Chinese companies. Anything to add, Kazuki or Natasha? One more thing on this, and then we'll go to the uh, pandemic online learning um, series of questions, and I think we'll wrap up after that. And Natasha, I think that there was a question specifically uh, directed towards you in the, I think it's down towards the bottom. So check that out. Um, okay, then we have a, a student asking, how specific should the research proposal be? You know, well, this is, this is a really big question. Um, so first off, you only have one page. And so that's going to really limit how much depth you can go into. Um, now, some students can, you know, you can choose different strategies. You know, you can write a very formal, really specific, I'm interested in um, looking at China's relations with Central and South Asia in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative. And I plan to use the realist, um, you know, international relations theory to analyze multiple bilateral relationships along BRI in Central and South Asia. And then you can talk about specific scholars and books that you've looked at and maybe someone at Peking University you're interested in studying with. Okay, that sounds good. You know, you can do that. And if we like the rest of the application, you might get an interview. And then we will discuss your proposal and try to sort of push back on some of the things, maybe some of the assumptions you're making. Or if you you know, if you're not ready to make that specific, you can certainly say, you know, you can take a different strategy. You know, these are the problems and the processes that I find fascinating and I want to study. I don't know yet if I wanted to do an econ and management or a more of a history and, you know, economics influenced history project, but I, these are the books that I've read and I really thought they were very helpful. I would like to try to see how I could explore this topic under the guidance of a thesis advisor at Peking University. It's, it's about being honest, certainly, but also showing us what you know, showing us how you think about the research project and showing us how you write about it. Again, we do not demand that your research proposal is what you actually end up doing your master's thesis in but uh, we want to see you thinking deeply about this through your writing. Consider this potentially the first written piece in a two plus year conversation about what you're really interested in researching uh, in China studies. Kazuki, Natasha, anything I would like to add to that? Okay, so um, now let's talk about the pandemic and how it's been uh, affecting Yanjing Academy. 
Um, so first off, um, you know, like any graduate program, any university around the world, you know, we were all blindsided by the severity um, and length of time of the COVID of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, our, our campus was shut down suddenly um, in late January, uh, and we had no idea how long it was going to last. We adjusted to full online courses in the spring, and since then, most of our international scholars, or none of our international scholars, had been able to return to campus, including, unfortunately, Natasha and her members and her other classmates in the fifth cohort of Yanjing Scholars. Um, we are still fully online for our classes in the fall semester. However, we do have about just under 30 scholars on campus with us right now, maybe 27, 28. Those include mainland Chinese scholars. Those include scholars from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, um, which I think we only have a, a few scholars from Hong Kong in the fifth cohort or in the sixth cohort, the 2020 class. Um, we also have an Australian uh, Yenjing scholar who's on campus with us now because he either fortunately or per, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, he was in China for the entire course of the pandemic, already resident in Beijing, so he didn't have to worry about the border closure and visa restrictions. And also we have some Korean scholars who um, the border is open bilaterally for students moving to and from South Korea and China, and we're waiting for those scholars to arrive on campus right now. We plan to be running um, a combination of online and offline courses for the entirety of the 2020 to 2021 academic year. Why? You know, we still are hopeful that some of our international scholars, if not all, will be able to come to campus at some point during 2020 to 2021. But it is highly, highly, highly unlikely that all of the scholars from around the world will be able to come back at the same time. Likely, in terms of the way that China tends to like to conduct its uh, international relations more bilaterally, that it's very likely that China will be looking at the relative rates of success in um, combating COVID-19 spread and will open up the borders to countries or regions in a staggered fashion so that some will be able, able to come back earlier than others. So we know that even when some international scholars can come, not all will. So we'll have combinations of online and offline um, courses and activities. Will we be, you know, I cannot guarantee that by, by late August that all the borders will be open from anywhere around the world to be able to travel to China. I still expect that it'll happen at some point in 2021, but this is out of my control and it, it's certainly not at Yanjing Academy's discretion, nor at Peking University's discretion, nor at you know, the Beijing municipal government's uh, discretion. I am hopeful and optimistic and we are planning to see Yanjing scholars on campus in you know, before, but definitely in fall of 2021. Um, so there's some other things I can say about that, but how about uh, Natasha, is there anything you'd like to share about uh, online learning and how that's been going with you uh, this year? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really good and a really realistic question to be asking from, from this you know, prospective student who, who raised this. Um, what I would say is there's, there's two dimensions to this question. The first is the academic dimension. So Yenjing, as, as Brent said, the Yenjing Academy made a very kind of quick and good decision in January to move everything online for the for the rest of the semester and it was a very smooth transition in that sense. Academically you were still getting access to the classes it was all put on zoom and um, it was an incredible transition in which you could still you know learn from all your students um, and there was still the seminar style of learning on that. Um, there was no difference to the workload in that sense and I feel like it was a very good online delivery of the course. The leisure sense as well, what you might be wondering, like how, how am I still going to be connected to my classmates and how am I still going to get the China experience? That comes down to the students. And this again was dealt with very, very well, I think, this year 
in all that we've, you know, that's all that's come this year. So the students were very quick to put together morning yoga classes that were done on Zoom, or we had a cooking week where everyone was bringing recipes in from different countries all over the world, and everyone had to cook, you know, a particular recipe. We've had online quizzes, we've had all sorts. So I think from both the top down level on the academic sense, it's it's been a very smooth and good delivery. And from the bottom up sense, there's still that collective, you know, sense of being a Yenjing scholar, which I was worried about initially in January. You know, will you still have that collective sense of being a group? But that definitely, you know, went way beyond my expectations. So this is something that from my experience, I don't think you need to worry about too much. Thanks so much, Natasha. Um, a couple of more questions about the you know, COVID-19 in relation to admissions for the 2021 cohort. Um, one question was, are we still accepting the same number of students? Yes, we are. Uh, we, we don't plan to, you know, we don't have any current plans to go over 125 students. I think that's the most we've ever accepted. Um, we are not planning on allowing for um, admissions deferrals for the 2021 cohort. Um, in general, we have a rule that does not allow any deferred admissions, um, certainly not for work opportunities or other graduate programs. That has been Yanjing Academy's rule since the beginning, and we will certainly be sticking to that, um, you know, that, that regulation. Um, this year, however, we did allow um, some scholars for personal emergencies or medical issues uh, to defer their admission from 2020 to 2021. Um, it was a very small number of scholars, you know, uh, under 20. Um, so those scholars still have a, a spot offered to them in the 2021 cohort, provided that they complete another round of admissions um, and indicating and committing that they will be coming. So, you know, we will be evaluating and seeing who uh, who deferred their admission from 2020 to 2021 will actually be coming. We are going to be running a full admissions process. Um, so you should certainly not be worried about, you know, the differences in numbers that might be there in 2021. What you should be focused on is putting together the best possible uh, application package that represents who you are, what you're interested in, why you want to study China in China, where you want to go with your career, and how you think a master's diploma from Peking University and two years in our community at Yanjing Academy can help you achieve those goals. Um, focus on that. Focus on the three C's, uh, commitment, charisma, and China. Um, focus on those and um, you know it'll work itself out. Okay, um, finally, um, one question um, that we're gonna wrap up with because uh, we're already significantly over time. We have a question about um, thesis topics. Um, are there topics that are too sensitive to write on? Uh, what about access to historical archives, uh, research resources available at Peking University archives or other sources? Um, so good question, important question. Um, so in Nanjing Academy classes, um, you know, you are free to ask any question you want to ask. Any topic will be discussed. It is um, an open environment for academic inquiry. For thesis topics, um, that same rule holds true, but you need to remember that your thesis advisors um, faculty members here have to also evaluate your intended thesis topic based on feasibility. Is this practically possible for a master's student, whether international or Chinese master's student, to realistically conduct this thesis project? Will sources be available? And I think that is something that, you know, you should rely on faculty here and your potential thesis advisor to help guide you. You specifically mentioned historical archives. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much specifics on this because it really depends. You know, um, the number one historical archives has still been open. The number two from the Republican period in Nanjing, I've heard it's, it's you know, not as, as easily accessible for scholars, both domestic scholars and international scholars. So it really depends on the specifics of your, 
research project. But I like the question because whatever, whatever research area you're working in, whatever your specific topic is, whatever time period it covers, access to sources is absolutely fundamental to your research project success. So you're already thinking in the right way. Um, once you, if you're accepted, then you're going to need to reach out to faculty members and always find a research project that will have a source base that is easily accessible and can be one that you can really dig into to um, have the evidence you need to discuss the topics that you're interested in discussing. Okay, well, we are almost at two hours. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up here at this stage. Um, I apologize if there are some questions that weren't answered in um, either on text or live in our information session. Uh, if you have any of those questions, please reach out to us at yca-admissions at pku.edu.cn and we'll do our best to uh, answer any inquiries that you might have. Uh, Kazuki, Natasha, really, really a pleasure to see you both again. Thank you so much for taking this time out of your busy schedule. Natasha, I imagine it's pretty early in the morning where you are. Kazuki, I imagine it's pretty late in the evening where you are. Thank you both so much for joining us and thank all of the webinar attendees for your interest in Yanjing Academy of Peking University. I hope this has been helpful. Check out our website. We'll have the video up and you can learn more about our program and application procedures. Hope to see your applications. Do not forget December 4th, noon, Beijing time, application deadline. Thank you all so much for your time. And we are now going to sign off. Have a good evening.